Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. We're going to talk about some of the changes to the reports. <clears throat> so there's been some new filters and columns added to the report. So it'll be if you've watched the pre-training for this, these are, this is the part that's going to be a little bit different because we're going to talk. We'll talk about what's been added. So the adult age students with disabilities and transition status. Um, was there previously as post-secondary transition. So they changed the name to adult this, this there. And um, by popular request, we've added the CTE completer. Now the CTE completers help determine your college and career, or your CCIs on a California dashboard. So there's a filter option for this um, that's been added for this year. Um, you'll be able to select that in, in the filter and then the results that come up in the reports would be the CTE completers. One thing I wanna point out though with this is it's new for this year going forward. Um, if you look at your 1920 or previous cohorts and the CTE fil completer filter is there, it won't give you any results because it's new for this year going forward. Um, and then along those lines, they've added a whole bunch of work-based learning um, filter options and columns on the reports. And this data for the work-based learning is collected in the end of year one. And there are, um, it, it's a file called the WBLR file and there's specific codes for each of these. The good thing, and, I, and we touched upon it re really briefly before is now the core expected graduation year reports can go up to four years. So you can run this year's and your future years. And I'm gonna be talking about that in detail in a minute. Also, I wanted to point out that all these terms and other terms are, um, in the glossary in your workbook. We added all those so you can see those definitions of all those. Okay, so this slide is the same slide as the one that's on the pre-training, but um, just to kind of review it, to get to your cohort reports, you go to um, the menu bar and you would select accountability monitoring report, um, and then the reports that you can select. For most of you, it'll be the 15.1 outcome counts and rates and student details on the 15.2 uh, for your counties, the county authorizing report, which is basically the 15.1 report only for each of the districts showing up for the county. To access this uh, report, you do need the SNR view role. Okay, the next slide is kind of showing you the progression report. So for this year, um, you can see the grade nine through grade 12 in the, the years that Paul had described. Now that's gonna be frozen again, August 27th. And we're all gonna hammer that data in. Um, and as Alex mentioned, that will be frozen, but you'll be able to view the future years, the 2021, 22, up to the 2024. Those will continue to run, even though this year will freeze on August 27th, the other ones will continue to run for future. So any changes made would be reflected in future year cohort reports. Okay, this slide here. So why is that good? How can that help you? Um, this is gonna allow you to monitor during the student's re enrollment period. Um, and the reason, I think the reason we added this is because a lot of you guys requested it um, because you had to wait and to the end and you had to reconcile data from the last four years. I don't remember where those kids are, what happened, they left, you know, they were gone, but now you can do it during the entire enrollment period um, by looking at these future reports. And the, the slide on the right shows you, uh, or I mean, the little graphic on the right just shows you that you can, what show what pops up when you select the filter. So not only this year, but all the way to 22, 20, uh, 20 23, 2024. 20, and so this next slide kind of shows you some of the things you can do proactively. And this isn't a complete list, but this is just a list of some of the outcomes. So for example, um, you can look at some of your students that are marked as dropouts now in future years and, 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 and just check, is their exit code accurate? Is that, you know, did they transfer to another school? Do you see that they are now showing up in another school? And if so, you can go and make, the correction to your exit code to change it from a, a, a code that would count as a dropout to a transfer because, oh yeah, they did transfer to another school. And then looking at the future report now, you would make that change and wait for the update overnight. Next day you come back, hey, they're not showing up as a dropout anymore. Um, so these are just some of the things you can do there. Okay, um, so here's the 15.1 and showing you um, 
what's highlighted is you can select future years or the current year. And then the, the fact that we've added the CT completer and then the, the adult age student with disabilities in transition status filter. And here's your 15.2 um, with uh, the CT completer and then all the work-based learning choices that have been added. And um, this one is, uh, there's a new code that's been added, an outcome code. Um, this is very similar to the E230 480 matriculated code, which if you look at the preview uh, training, um, we tell you that that's very rare. Well, this is another one that's gonna be very rare. Um, I think in the whole state, maybe 10 students. So for most of you, this is gonna be not, not used, but let me explain what this is. Um, this would be a student that um, matriculates to a private school or a school outside of California. And why this is rare is this is if, um, let's say your high school just goes to 11th grade and the student is done with 11th grade, but they haven't graduated yet, but they're done with 11th grade and they're matriculating. And then they matriculate to a private school that has 12th grade. Then that's where you would use this code. But again, 99.5% of you are not even gonna use this code. <laughs> Uh, the thing to remember about this is when you do, um, that reminder says all exit completion codes that remove the student from the cohort require written documentation. So that's important to remember that. Okay, and now we're gonna review the reports and the calculations. I'm gonna be covering the 15.1 and, and Alex is gonna be going over 15.2 in, in really good detail. So here's the 15.1 and, and both these reports are pretty wide. So we have to break them up into little sections here. Um, but the first section is gonna be your col column A, which is your students that are removed from the cohort and your promoted matriculated. Again, the promoted matriculated is gonna be zero and mostly for all the LAs, except for just a few. Um, the thing to remember is these students were, are not part of the cohort student totals, which is in your column B there. Column B is your total cohort students. These are students from all your outcomes totaled up. This is the number that's gonna be the denominator for all the rates that are calculated that you see in those rate columns there. So in column C, these are all your possible outcomes on the report. So the bulk of you, I would hope, and I, I think this is how it usually is, are regular high school diploma graduates. This is where you hopefully see the, the highest percentage, um, but then you have your uh, California high school proficiency exam, your adult ed, diplomas and, and your dropouts still enrolled, all these. These are all going to be um, part of the numerator in the calculation for these rates for each of these columns. So you're gonna have your outcome population, which is all the Cs, and that's gonna be divided by your cohort population, which is the B, the total cohort. And you'll divide that, multiply that by 100, and that will give you the rates that are listed in each of these columns. So here's an example. And again, this is on the preview training, but we just wanna review that again. Um, so you have your outcome divided by your cohort population. So let's say we take your high school uh, diploma students. So you have 295 total, and then you have out of all your outcomes, 312, and you're gonna divide that. And then you're going to get a decimal number and you're gonna multiply that by hundred and that's gonna give you your percentage. So in, in this case, this high school has a uh, high school diploma graduate rate of 94.55%. Okay, and so the thing to remember here is the reports and the calculations of, of the student groups and the time periods where this data is coming from, the time periods used, I should say. And then it also shows you the record types for where this data comes from. So your socioeconomically disadvantaged, which there's a, a note down at the bottom for how that's calculated, your migrant ed, your English learners, your students with disabilities, your foster use, and your homeless. Um, that data will come from any record from any LEA where the enrollment or period span the cohort period. So and for this year, it would be if they were in any of these categories from July 1st, 2017 through August 15th, 2021, they're gonna count. So example of that, say you had a, a student come to you, um, they were homeless, let's say, um, three LEAs ago in the ninth grade, but since then they're not homeless anymore. They haven't shown up homeless at all, but in ninth grade in, in the 
17, 18 year, they were homeless for a period. Um, but they haven't been homeless in the last three years, but they show up homeless on your cohort report because of the fact that they were homeless within this four year period. And then the last two are your ethnicity, race, and your gender. That's gonna come from the student information file, your SIMP file, and that's the most recent in the last four years. So if there were one, one gender in, in their freshman year, but then something changed or something changed um, in the last record that was uploaded, that's what's gonna show up on your cohort report. And here's the 15.2, so I'm gonna pass it off to Alex. Thanks, Gary. All right, folks, the 15.2 cohort report gives us a student list and it's kind of a beast of a report. It has 32 different columns and the data is all coming from different files, right? It's, it's, it's comprised of different files and, and different data elements. And so even if this isn't the first time that you're doing cohort, looking at this report can be a little bit overwhelming. And you may look at this and not even know where to start or how to use it. And it can be such a powerful tool. And so what we're going to do here is uh, we've broken it down in four different chunks. And in the next few slides, I'm going to go into each category. And we're going to try to do two things. We're going to, one, explain to you what you're looking at, where this data is coming from, and two, hopefully get you thinking, get you inspired on how you can use this report locally to help you validate your data and make sure that you have um, a, a smooth uh, validation process, right, for your cohort. So we're going to start off with the general student info. And this, these are basic data elements. The first uh, chunk here that we're going to uh, point out are the SCNR uh, data elements uh, that are coming from your SCNR file. And then the second chunk are your SINF your SIMF records, and as Gary pointed out in slide 25, um, the SIMF records that are coming into the report are the student's most recent SIMF records based on the effective date that overlaps the cohort period. And the reason why that's important is because when you're validating your report and you're looking at a student and you're realizing, hey, gender is wrong, ethnicity is wrong, the birthday is wrong, it may be that the data that is being pulled is from a previous district and you haven't submitted a most recent SIMF record for that student. So just something to point out, even if it's not your LEA that submitted that SIMF record, it's still going to be pulled if it's the most recent. Next, we come to the student, uh, to the subgroup attributes. And this slide is a lot more colorful, you'll notice, and that's just because it's coming from different data files. And we're going to start off with the SPRG file. Uh, these are your uh, homeless and migrant ed. I think that's program code 191 for homeless and 131 for the migrant ed. The big one here that we want to point out is the students with disabilities. And the reason why it's a big one is because it's coming from two different files. It's from the SPED file, which we're all way too familiar with at this point, right? And then also from the SPRG file. The SPRG file, it's looking at that um, code that we used to use, code 144. And for the veterans here, you'll, you'll remember that. And the reason why it's pulling from both is because we need to remember that this is a four-year cohort, right? So the SPED and SSRV files were introduced and implemented in CalPAD's 1920 academic year. So we may have some students in the cohort that only have a program code 144. And so if you're validating your report and you're realizing the student doesn't have a SPED record, check the program record for the student. They likely have a 144 in there within the cohort period. Then we have the English learner. Uh, and again, this is from our, our CELA files and it's any EL record within the cohort period. Just a reminder, slide 25 that Gary covered, that's, that's going to be super helpful for you when you're validating this data. Um, especially when it comes to the next two fields, which are calculated fields. Uh, what I mean by calculated fields is that you're not providing us with this indicator in any file. There's no specific field that you're submitting that says, yes, the student is foster youth, or yes, the student is socioeconomically disadvantaged. CalPAS is doing 
the matching for foster youth in the back end for us, right? It's doing the socioeconomically disadvantaged calculation for us in the back end as well. So again, slide 25 covers in, in detail what it, um, what it all entails for the socioeconomically disadvantaged. Next is the cohort specific attributes. This slide isn't as colorful. The big chunk of these data elements are coming from SCNR file and the rest are calculated fields but the fields are calculated based off of SCNR data. And so this slide really emphasizes just the importance of SCNR data and making sure that you have uh, high quality data in CalPads uh, for your SCNR. But the other thing that we want to point out in this slide is just how powerful this section can be when validating your cohort reports. I can tell you from experience when I was at the district level, this chunk of columns was what I used every year to send out to my high school registrars because it gave them all the information that they needed. You know, um, when the student entered the cohort, when uh, what cohort category they were looking at. If, so, for example, I would filter on all the dropouts and I would tell them, can you verify the exit reason is correct for this student because they're being counted as dropouts in the cohort? And, and this was the important part was that I included the start date and the exit date for them because, as we've mentioned, some students they haven't heard of or, or thought about in three years, right? And so if you include the start and end dates in there for them, then they can at least think or, or know where to start digging when they're validating stuff in the, in the SIS. And a lot of the times what I found was that the SIS may have been updated, but that exit code just never made its way into CalPads, right? Or maybe the SIS has notes in there that said the student went out of the country, but the exit code was never populated. And so this is a very powerful tool that you can use to help validate where these students, why these students are in that specific category and when the student was, why the student was counted, what dates are being pulled for that. And the other thing we wanted to mention here is think about how you can use the future year functionality. Because now that you can run the reports for future years, you don't have to wait until that cohort year for you to send these reports over to your registrars or whoever's handling the enrollment at your district, right? You can be pulling reports earlier for your current ninth graders who are already falling into your dropout category, for example, and it'll be fresher in their minds than especially this year that it's weird with COVID and distance learning. Maybe your registrars haven't even seen or interacted with that student ever for the year, right? And so maybe having those students presented to them now will be way more beneficial than having to wait until the cohort year of that student comes around. Um, and, and also, now that the cohort reports are available throughout the year, you don't have to wait until April, right? You can run these reports in August, September, October, and you can start doing that validation earlier on. So there's so many different um, benefits to, to, to having these new functionality that are going to hopefully benefit you. And then lastly, we come to the last chunk, which are the completer specific attributes. Um, the first three data elements are coming from your SCNR file. And these aren't, there's no difference here. The, this is how it's been for the past few years. Um, but the last part of these, I think seven, are coming from the new work based learning file. Okay, so. We want to point out that the first three work-based learning data elements here that have the red asterisk, those have um, were previously we were previously collecting those work-based learning indicators in the SCNR file, and so this report is also going to be looking at SCNR records that fall within the cohort period that have a Y indicator for those three data elements. Right. So again, when you're validating the reports and you're looking at a student, you're saying, I haven't even submitted a work based learning file at all. It look at the SCNR records for that student. It's probably because at some point during the cohort period, you had a Y indicator for one of these programs. And the other thing that we wanted to point out here, 
these columns are what's going to impact your CCI indicator, your college and career indicator on the dashboard. The one, there's one extra um, data element that doesn't have a column here, which is the CTE completer. The CTE completer is also impacting your CCI indicator. And although we don't have a column for it, you can still look at students that are CTE completers by using the filter that Gary uh, was mentioning earlier on. The 15.2 has a CT completer filter, and you can use that to look at students that are CT completers within your cohort. Um, and again, use the new functionality because um, a lot of the times we didn't, well, before, we didn't have any insight as to how many students were on track for meeting CCI indicators, right? And now you can look at future years and see which students are, are approaching all these indicators. Um, maybe it's not you who cares about CCI indicator, but someone at your district, I'm sure does. So share that with them and let them know that they can run future year cohorts to look at CCI indicator progress and um, they can run the reports at any time during the year, right? So just some other things to think about when, when you're looking at this chunk of the, of the report. And with that, I know that was a lot. I know that was a lot of different data points and, and it, can, it can be hard to remember everything, but the good thing is that you don't have to remember everything. We've written it down for you. We have what we call mapping guides for our cohort reports that are available in our CalPads user manual. The user manual has tons of fabulous information about really everything in CalPads, but the mapping guides are particularly helpful when you're trying to remember how did this number, like what are they using to generate this number? We've broken it down similar to what we just went through, but even, even better because not only does it tell you what file it's coming from, but it also tells you which field within the file. And then for all those calculated fields, it gives you a breakdown of how CalPaz is calculating that, uh, that indicator, right? So, we have a screenshot here of what the mapping guides look like. And the way that it works is that we've numbered each column. And for example, if you wanted to look at um, how is the students with disability column number or indicator being generated, you say, okay, column 10, and then you scroll down and you find column 10 listed there and it'll it'll give you the, the, uh, the rules, the business logic behind what is being used to pull that information into the report. And it's also worth mentioning that we have mapping guides for every report in CalPads. It's not just the cohort reports. So if at any point you're validating your end of year, for example, you can come to the user manual and find whichever report you want to look at and it, it'll it, it, the mapping guides will be available for you there. So now we come to accountability, right? Why are we doing this? <laughs> um, it's an important question. So the reason why we're collecting this data is this data is being used for the California dashboard. So all the data that you're posting in CalPads is going to be pulled and the dashboard does its own calculations in the back end to then publicly display the information for your district, right? And so a lot of the times what will happen is that, at least from experience, people will come to you and they'll ask you, how come this number is this number once it's public? Once the, the public is able to see this information, then that's when they come to you and they say, why is, why is the dashboard giving us however many graduates, right? So it's important that you know how CalPads was looking at the data, what it used for the, for the calculation, but it's not going to tie it one to one with what you're seeing on the dashboard. And I think that's the main point that we want to hammer home here is there is no report in CalPads that will give you a direct mirror of what you're going to see in the dashboard. And the technical guide, the California dashboard technical guide, which is the first link that you see there, will give you the business logic behind what the dashboard is doing with the data that you posted from CalPads. Similar with the DAS, right? The, the link at the bottom there gives you the uh, website for the DAS schools. They, we don't have a cohort report for DAS schools. 
any DAS school, any high school will have just the four-year grad rate. That's the only thing that CalPATS has. And to get more information on the DAS schools, you can go to that website and it'll give you a lot more information as to how that all is being calculated once the data is pulled from CalPATS. The really cool thing though, and this was new this week, Wednesday, I think, is that uh, the accountability office at CDE has created this amazing CalPads to dashboard handbook. And if you've ever been asked, you know, or you yourself have wondered, I certainly have, when you're reading these reports, you're like, what, what am I even looking at? How do I even start validating? How do I know what's going to end up in the dashboard? This handy dandy handbook will give you that. And what I want to point out here is just look at the table of contents. <laughs> I was super excited when I when I saw this because it gives you steps to success, right? So when you're thinking about like, where do I even begin? How does this all work? It gives you a breakdown of why you're doing what you're doing, how you can um, make sure that you are giving uh, accurate high data quality information that is going to represent your district, right? Because that's the bottom line is this information is going to be public. So how can you ensure that you are giving us a true representation of what's happening at your LEA? And then it breaks it down for each item within the, um, the dashboard, what reports and CalPads you should be validating. And what's even cooler is that it gives you which filters to use within the report. Okay, so when someone comes and asks you, why is this number this number? Yes, you can look here. Yes, you can look at the mapping guides. But my recommendation would be send this off to whoever is going to be asking you these questions now and say, this is why you should be reviewing this now, because it's going to come back and you're going to ask me about it later. Right. So it's just it's, it's super. Um, I, we just want to make sure that you know that this exists and, and that it's going to be helpful for you. And with that, Paul is going to do the fun part. <laughs>